Well, good evening, everybody. It's good to have everybody out this evening and the shortest week of the year is when we have these meetings. It just seems like it flies by and it's just been good to come every night and get the batteries charged up a little bit and uh, just sit under that good singing and good preaching. So praise the Lord for what he's done. I know he's helped me and I think he's helped some of y'all and I just praise him for that. Looking forward to the night. Uh, of course, Ben and them had to get on back and uh, get to their church. They tried to, not to miss their church and I kind of well, I just, that's refreshing to see some folks that just dedicated to their church, you know. I think they had to drive all the way back and then drive to their church, and uh, they try to stay right there in it. But uh, we got something really good, which is our own choir, and they can't beat that. We've got great choir and great music, so we let them have at it a little bit tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you again. You're so good to us. And uh, what a week we've had, Lord. Thank you for illuminating your word, uh, for plowing through our hearts, Lord God. And and just breaking light on some things, Lord, in my life. And, I, and I'm sure you've, you've helped people, Lord, the uh, way you helped me. And so we just give you the praise for that. May we uh, lift your precious son up, the Lord Jesus, Lord. It's all about him uh, and, and just giving him honor. And, and Lord, we just uh, thank you again and we love you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give our choir a hand. How about that?
was a wretch I remember who I was I was lost, I was blind I was running out of time Sin separated The breach was far too wide But from the far side of the chasm you held me in your sight So you made a way Across the great divide Left behind heaven's throne To build it here inside And there at the cross You paid the debt I owed Broke my chain freed my soul for the first time I had hope thank you Jesus for the blood applied thank you Jesus it has washed me wide thank you Jesus you have saved my life tomb of sin you were buried for three days and then you walked right out again now death has no sting and life has no end for I have been transformed by the blood of
choir's coming down, why don't you stand up, find somebody that you had not shake their hand lately, not, not somebody that you even know, just go shake their hand and greet them and tell them you love them. Okay, you, you folks settle down now. That's a good crowd. Good to see everybody fellowshipping and uh, shaking hands and meeting one another. It's always a good chance to, always a good time to meet somebody maybe you hadn't met before. As we grow, um, you know, you just get bigger and there's more people and it's just hard to get around to everybody. And so that's a good chance to get a hold of some folks that maybe you don't know that well and learn some names and, and just fellowship and make people feel welcomed. And uh, sometimes we forget that as we grow because, you know, we get bigger, but we don't want to forget that. We want to we want to love people and fellowship with them and and uh, get to know them and stuff. So thank you for just being a loving church. Thank you for this good crowd on this uh, last night of uh, our meeting and everything and uh, what, a, what a week we've had. And so thank you, Brother Ron, 
Miss Judy, thank y'all for being here, and uh, just appreciate you so much. And so, uh, are you ready, my brother? Ready to go. All right, man. All right. Let me just uh, give a word of appreciation from Judy and I for a lot of things. One is just the fellowship with your pastor and with you as a church. We have so enjoyed our time always here at Solid Rock. And I'm appreciative of a lot of the hospitality. The food this week is off the charts. And uh, if I could take some of it home with me, I would. But I probably am. Maybe a few, <laughs> few extra pounds. But the Lord has been good. We certainly uh, just enjoyed our time. Enjoyed playing golf yesterday with a couple of the men here and uh, fellowshipping together. And Judy and I, out of all the places we go, there's none that we enjoy more than here. She has decided at this particular stage in life that she's not going with me as much as she did. I know she still loves me, but she will not miss coming here. And so in order for y'all to enhance and help my marriage, I appreciate you inviting me over. <laughs> it's, it's good to be in God's house. Have your Bible, let's look together in Romans chapter 8. I do want to reiterate something about the materials and the books. I shared with you, I think, and you've heard me say that Bone of His Bone, I've read every year for 43 years other than the Bible, is the book that enlightened me more than any other concerning two things, that Christ not only died for me, but as me, and that I participated with him in death, burial, and resurrection. That to me was life changing. I read that in 1980, and I've never ever strayed by the grace of God, from understanding those truths. I don't believe that you'll ever grow and mature as a believer until you realize those truths. And then I would say to you that the little classic, Calvary Road. I just talked to a lady who got it yesterday and she read some of it and said, my, how God spoke to her. I've never read Calvary Road by Roy Hessian that I didn't have to get right with somebody. Relationships are important. And if you're not right with each other, you can't be right with the Lord. And so Calvary Road's a classic on repentance and brokenness and reconciliation. And then another book called Victory in Christ. Now, those of you who read Bone of His Bone, and it's been kind of tough, and it's more complicated, Victory in Christ is simpler. Now, I would encourage you to start with that one concerning the Christ life, Victory in Christ by Trumbull, written in the early 1900s. He was the head of the Sunday School Times, and uh, he had some connections to the movement that started in England called the Keswick Movement. And I've been a student of that movement for a long time. And then a book by... Joseph Carroll, who I was good friends with. He was an Australian. He was a missionary to Japan. He's the most unusual mystic that I ever met. When I was around him, I felt like he could look right through me. Now, he was cordial. He was nice. But he was full of God. Uh, never will forget when I had him at my church. You have to realize I was pastor of the church, 3,000 members, and had him in, and I thought I was somebody. And I noticed all week that he wore the same suit with a different tie every night. I said to him, I said, Joseph, my church would be honored if I could just take you to a men's store and buy you some clothes, I've noticed you've worn the same suit every night. He responded, 
Young man, don't tell me with mission needs all over the world you buy a lot of clothes. He said, I bought this suit at Goodwill. And he said, when I wear it out, I'll get another one. I tell you, I felt about that tall. And uh, he was the most, when he died, he owned nothing. He had to pray in almost $2 million a year to keep the school that he had operating. Never let a need be known. Live like George Mueller. And then we'll forget the story he told me about uh, as he came back to the United States and married a American girl on the mission field, came to the United States after he's run out of uh, that part of the world, you know, all those things that transpired. And God would not allow him to have medical insurance. Now he said to me, he said, I'm not imposing this on you or anybody else, but God would not allow me to have insurance because he said if I did, I wouldn't trust him. He had a daughter, a uh, son, I believe, had to have surgery at the Mayo Clinic. Paid for completely. And he was just an unusual, unusual man. And then the, lastly, there's that book called The Life of God and the Soul of Man. Do you know the story about that book? Let me give it to you briefly. In 1650, Henry Skugel was born. Henry Skugel, when he was saved at a young age in Scotland, about 10, by the time he was 13, he could read the Great New Testament. By the time he was 15, he could read the Hebrew Old Testament. By the time he was 17, he had graduated from college. By the time he was 18, he was pastoring a church and was a professor at a college right there in Scotland. When he was 27, he wrote out those sermons called The Life of God in the Soul of Man. Never got to preach them. He actually wrote them out as letters to a friend. He died at 27. Leukemia. He died thinking nobody was really influenced by his life. Charles Wesley got a copy of them. Charles Wesley read those in the 1700s, shared them with John Wesley. Both of them said this, for the first time I understand that Christianity is far more than believing objective facts about Jesus. It's an interpersonal, subjective experience with the living Christ living in and through me. They shared it with a man by the name of George Whitfield. Do you know anything about American history? If you know anything about American history, there's two men that God used to establish this country in Christianity in the first great awakening before the birth of our country. One was George Whitfield and the other was Jonathan Edwards. Whitfield read that little book and was converted. J.I. Packer, who wrote the book Knowing God, said this little work has met, meant so much to me it's got to be put in modern English. And so they wrote it out and it's in modern English that you can understand and it is a profound book about the life of Christ. You say, Preacher, it sounds like to me these things mean a great deal to you. I would say to you, What you hear from your pastor and what you've heard this week is so important to your living. Because in America, we think the way that you live is to live. No, the way you live is to die. And we found out in Romans 6 that we died when Jesus died. Romans 6 unlocks the Christian life by telling you that Christianity is not imitating Jesus. I tried that for so long. I tried it the first seven or eight years I was a Christian. 
I tried to be like Jesus. I kept hearing preachers say, is that Christ-like? Are you Christ-like? Now you really are full of yourself if you think you can be like Him. The only person that can be like Christ is Christ. And Christ has come to live in you by the person of the Holy Spirit, not do away with your individuality nor your personality, but it's Christ in you that makes the difference. If you take Jesus out of you, you're not any different than what you are right now. What makes you a Christian is Christ in you. I want to emphasize that. Chapter 7 we look Monday night how we struggle. I mean, some of us try to live the Christian life. Even though we know that Christ is our life, we still think we can. We've been told in this country that God helps those who help themselves. How's that working for you? That's not a Bible verse. That's not what the Bible teaches. God doesn't help those who help themselves. God helps the helpless. I found myself in a horrible pit in the Maya clay. Somebody came by me one day with a nail-scarred hand, picked me up, put me on a solid rock, put his life inside of me. I've been singing ever since. I've been sharing ever since because Christ makes the difference. Now, here's the distinction. Not one mention of the Holy Spirit in six. Not one mention of the Holy Spirit in seven, but 19 references to the Holy Spirit in chapter eight. I like what Oswald Chambers says. If you're looking for a good devotion, my wife has read it for how many years, Judy? Your whole life. What, that's that 71 years? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I know. But you've read it since you've been a believer, right? And here's what Oswald Chambers says. Listen to this. You have only one responsibility as a Christian, and that's to be rightly related to the Lord every day by the Holy Spirit. Joseph Carroll, one time when we were in a conference together, I had the opportunity to be with him so much, and so I asked him what you ask people a lot. I said, how you doing, Joseph? Here's how he responded. I'll never, I'll never forget this. He said, I'm doing as good as the Holy Spirit will let me be. I thought, dear me. You know, I've never heard anybody say that in all my days. And I, let's just think about your day today. How was your day? Did you realize today that any demand on you was not a demand on you, but the Holy Spirit or the life of Christ that lives in you? Do you understand that every moment of every day is really the pressures on Him, not on you? Do you know everything around you can be exploding and yet on the inside you're just as calm as you can be? That's a natural, supernatural life. Live supernaturally, naturally. And God is the one who does that and only God can manifest that kind of life because we are to be different. And the reason we're different is because of Him. Well, let me pick up where I... You say, well, why'd you do all that? Because I want to try to recapitulate and recapture. You know, it's something for you to hear. It's another for you to really hear. It's one thing for you to be here, it's another for that which you're hearing to be you. It's one thing for you to know that Christ is in you. It's another for Christ to get access to you in your redeemed humanity and think through your mind, walk through your feet, work through your hands, look through your eyes, speak through your mouth, listen through your ears. It's another for Him to be Him in you. Now, last evening, let me give you my points. If you didn't get them, I talked to you about the residing person of the Holy Spirit. I dealt with verse 9 and verse 16. The residing person of the Holy Spirit. 
If he doesn't reside in you, you're not a Christian. You say, but how, how do all Pentecostals believe? Pentecostals believe that you do not necessarily receive the Holy Spirit when you're converted. They believe that you must be later baptized by the Holy Spirit. You say, well, are they wrong? They're completely wrong. Now, if you think I'm trying to be argumentative or tell them that they're wrong, see, the spirit of the age, and especially here in this country, is that when you say something's wrong, you don't have that right. I got news for you, it's wrong. And you need to believe correctly. If you didn't receive the Holy Spirit, you're not born again. And you receive the Holy Spirit the moment that you're converted. There's 34 things happen to you that you had nothing to do with when God saved you. And one of them is the Holy Spirit resides. Now he ought to preside. It's one thing for him to be resident and it's another for him to be president. But he comes to live inside of you. The second thing I talked to you about last evening is not only the residing person of the Holy Spirit, but in verse 2, the ruling principle of the Holy Spirit. Verse 4, the righteous practice of the Holy Spirit. Verse 5, 6, 7, and 8 deal with this. The restricted pursuits of the Holy Spirit. God's cut things out of your life. God's placed things in your life that's of His nature. You love people. You're patient with people. You're forgiving toward others. But you're also pursuing holiness of life. And your want-tos have changed. You say, I do what I want to. Well, you do if you want what God wants you to want. And God changes your desires, your ambitions, your aims, your goals, your focus. God gives you good taste buds. And you have an appetite for His Word, and you can't get enough of it. I'm amazed here tonight. Look across here tonight. This is a Wednesday night. Look out here at this church. God's doing something among people here. Some of you are hungry. And so you have a good appetite. Now, notice the next thing. Notice what I call the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit. Where do you find that? Look at verse 10. Verse 10, the Bible says, And if Christ be in you, verse, chapter 8, verse 10, And if Christ be in you, actually it reads this way in the Greek, Since Christ is in you. That word if actually should be, can be translated since. Verse 10 again. The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. We already found out some of that in verse 4, that he works in us the righteous practice. Verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead Dwell in you. Now just right there, just ask yourself this question. Does the same spirit that caused Jesus Christ to get out of the grave, does that spirit now live in you? Well, it's got you out of the grave. That's who you were pre-salvation. Dead. You wasn't sick, you are dead. And somebody came by and raised you from the dead. Just like Lazarus was raised from the dead, physically you were raised from the dead spiritually. So verse 11, let's clarify. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also, now this is future, quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Now let me paraphrase that for you. When Jesus comes, you're gonna get a new body and the same spirit that raised your spirit from the dead and lives in your soul is going to give you a brand spanking new body. Aren't you looking forward to it? I don't know how much I'll weigh, but I'm looking forward to my new body, aren't you? Somebody said, well, 
I'll see him as he is and I shall be. So I'm going to get a body and the Spirit of God makes sure that that can happen. A.B. Simpson. He started the group called Missionary Alliance. A.B. Simpson was a mighty man of God. I don't agree with all of his theology, but he was a Christ life teacher and a Christ life preacher. A.B. Simpson says this about this text. A.B. Simpson says that the text is speaking yet of a new body, but can also be related here and applied to the fact that God keeps you alive until he's ready to take you home. Now you may think that you could die any moment. You're going to die when God wants you to die. Now God's in control of that. Now you, you're not. Your days are numbered. One of these days God's going to dial your number. And what you need to make sure is that you're right with him as much as you know. Now notice the next thing as we look at this text. Would you look at verse 12 and 13? I call this the repenting process of the Holy Spirit. Now let me paraphrase or read verse 12 and get your attention. Therefore, brethren, that's first of all, would you think that's speaking to all of us who say we're saved? That's family. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors. Now you know what it means to be a debtor. It means you owe somebody. You're a debtor not to the flesh. You don't owe your flesh a thing. That's why you're not to pacify it. You're not to justify it. He's already told you in chapter 7, in your flesh dwelleth no good thing. So don't you say to yourself, I can't help it. I know a lot of people who say they have, I can't help it. I know I should love them, but I can't help it. You don't know what they did to me. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that in my life. You're a debtor not to the flesh. But who are you a debtor to? Look at verse 12 again. Not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. Now I want to stop right there. Do you know what that means? Not that you'll die and go to hell. He's, talk, he's talking to save people. Now most people do not understand what I'm fixing to teach. And that's a reference right here to the sin unto death. Now the reason you don't understand the sin unto death is because you didn't, cat, you didn't capture what he said in chapter 6. Turn back to chapter 6. Look at verse number 16. Know ye not? that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto, what does it say? Or obedience unto righteousness. Let me just break that down for you. If you're a servant of your flesh, God's going to take you home prematurely if that's your bent and that's what you're determined to give yourself to because you belong to me and I'm not going to allow you to bring reproach and bring a bad testimony to my church or to me. So you have two options as a Christian. Understand that God's patient with you, works with you, and he understands your frailty. I use that word frailty. He understands your background, what you were saved from, what age you were saved. He knows how much you were taught when you were growing up. But he realizes that some of us are more of a work for him than others. But we're all in this together. 
And not everybody here tonight is on the same level. I think we have one here that today made a profession of faith and confessed Christ. And, and so we got a baby here tonight. That's what you'd call a new convert. Now babies are messy. I mean, babies, they, they had not learned how to walk. And, you know, they're going to tell you two things. They're going to tell you when they need to be changed and they're going to tell you when they want to be fed. And so everybody here is on a different level. 1 John 2 deals with that. You have what, babies, young men. You have those who are adolescent. Then you have mature fathers and, and ladies. Everybody's on a different level. But we're all in this together. Now what is the sin unto death? I knew you'd want to know. Turn with me to 1 John. 1 John chapter 5. Now where is 1 John? Well, it's right before Revelation. 1 John chapter 5. You have those three epistles of John. Then you have the book of Jude. But in 1 John chapter 5, he's dealing with this matter of prayer. And he says this. I want to start at verse 14 because you've got to get it in context. This is the confidence we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Now, most of us have read verse 13. Verse 13 is that you know you're saved. How do you know you're saved? God hears your prayers. Now, verse 15. If we know that he hears us, Whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Well, if it's not his will, you didn't receive. But because it was his will to say no. Somebody said, how does God answer prayer? Four ways. Yes, no, wait, you got to be kidding. <laughs> but you know, God is the one who hears. Now look at verse 16. It's going to blow your mind. If a man sees brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask. You have an obligation here at Solid Rock when you see one of these people who are part of this family going astray, you have the responsibility to talk to them and talk to the Lord for them. Galatians 6 1 says, Those of you who are spiritual should set that bone back in place. But you also have an obligation to pray for them. So if you see anybody that's sinning, <coughs> pray for them. But look at what he explains and says. And this is where the sin and the death comes into play. And he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that you should pray for it. Now, what does that mean? Well, here's what it means. It means that if you've got somebody who says they're saved and they are held captive by sin and they're determined to commit and commit and commit and commit and commit and practice that sin, according to 1 John, they will cross a deadline. And it won't be long before they die. And you can visit them in the hospital or you can see them and you can pray all you want to pray that God will raise them up. God won't hear anything that you have to say about it. It happened in my family. I understand what this is. That's why any person who is a Christian that's bringing disgrace to Christ. We want them to be restored. Let me give another illustration. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You have a man in the church at Corinth that was having a sexual liaison with his stepmother. And the Bible says that Paul turned him over to the devil for the destruction of his flesh that his soul might be saved 
so as by fire. Now what is that exactly that Paul is saying? Paul is saying that a Christian who commits the sin of the death forfeits all their reward at the beam of seat of Christ and everybody will not be the same in heaven and a person who commits the sin of the death will suffer loss at the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. Paul said, bring your body under subjection. Don't you allow your body, have you noticed in chapter 6, the emphasis on Christ living through you is controlling the members of your body. Now we associate the sin of death always with sexual sin. Now that's one that could be, but that's not all. I've seen people get away from God doctrinally, theologically, and God take them home prematurely because they were truly converted. How can a person do that? By following a guru. Now, who's a guru? Some of you may have a guru, somebody you like that's captivated your attention on the Internet. And so people kind of get uh, captivated by some slick teacher or charismatic movement. You don't have to agree with me, but I think the charismatic movement has done more to bring shame and disgrace on the name of Christ than about any movement that we've seen since 1970. If that's your background, I'd say to you, you need to be grounded in God's Word and not captivated by this health, wealth, and prosperity teaching and preaching that's out there. So the sin unto death, it's sort of like a Missile taking off from Cape Canaveral. And all of a sudden it reaches a point that it goes into space. Do I know who commits the sin of the death? We'll give you one illustration. No, I'm not. But it happened in my family. And when a person who says they're saved crosses God's deadline, there's no reconciliation. They do not lose their salvation. They forfeit all reward. And I actually could walk in to the hospital room and sense the presence of of demons. And that's what Paul meant in 1 Corinthians 5. Here's what he said to the church. Be careful. Now let's go back to Romans 8. Here's how you keep from committing the sin of the dead. How many of you like to know how the remedy is? But if ye through the Spirit, notice the Spirit, do mortify. It's the Greek word mortician. So when you go by the funeral home, it says mortician. It means to put to death. Now, I want to ask you a couple of questions. The reason I'm coming down here, so here's what most people believe. This is what most preachers believe. Because I have preachers tell me all the time, here's what they say. I'm trying to live the crucified life. I'm trying to crucify myself every day. How's that working for you? I mean, you get this hand up here and you nail it. How are you going to nail this? One? Now, what does it mean for the Spirit of God to mortify the deeds of the body? Listen to Ron Lynch. It means that you've already been crucified. 
you died once. When did you die? Romans 6, 6. When did you die? Galatians 2, 20. When did you die? Colossians 3, 1 through 4. When did you die? You died when Jesus died. So letting the Spirit of God put to death the things that are not dead in you is repentance daily, but it's also the Spirit of God's work. You can't do that. But you do have to agree that it's sin. And you do have, you've got to be willing to repent of it. And God, who gave you the gift of repentance, the number one way that you ought to know you're saved, it's not anything other than repentance. I like what Sinclair Ferguson said. Sinclair Ferguson says if you don't continuously, conspicuously repent all the time, then you never, ever, ever become a Christian. Now we're taught that repentance is a negative and it's a bad thing. God says it's a good thing. You say, well, I, I, I just don't think that I ought to tell people I'm nothing. You know, you know why? Because you listen to too many of these psychological, self-esteem, feel-good preachers. You say, well, do you think that boy in Houston, Texas preaches a bunch of lies? I believe that boy in Houston, Texas preaches a bunch of lies. Why? Because he tells you how good you are. I was talking to one of my family members the other night, and she said, Dad, you and I are the same. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I tell people that there's good in them, and I'm helping them to find it, and said, you go about it much differently than I do. But we're both the same because our goals are the same, and that's to help people. And I thought to myself, and then I said it. No, what you're doing and what I'm doing is totally opposite. <laughs> Can I ask you this question? What is the Spirit of God knocking off and knocking out of you right now? How many of you have ever been to Stone Mountain, Georgia? You been? Some generals up there on the mountain, right? How do you think they got there? Doug? How do you think those generals got there on that mountain? I'm going to tell you how they got there. Somebody had the audacity to knock off the mountain everything that don't look like them. <laughs> and that's what God did, and that's what God's doing for you. God says when he saved you, he put Jesus in you, and God says there's a bunch of things about you that don't look like him because only him looks like him. So i got to knock off for you everything that don't look like him so he can be him in me. And the way he does that, John Owen says, is repentance is the mortifying work or the regurgitating of self that God shows you daily. Don't it make you sick? I mean, do you ever just run your mouth and say, how can I do that? Why do I do that? Do you ever have any thoughts? You know, you meet somebody and you know that God has a sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? I mean, y'all think, I'm just telling you the truth. God's always working repentance in you. Always. When's the last time you sat down with your wife and had a good time of repentance? How about your children? Can I ask you a question? If we interviewed your children and grandchildren, would they say that you're a repenting person? Notice the redirecting path of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 14. As many as are led by the Spirit, they and only they are the sons of God. Now, can, I, I was raised over here in Lincoln County. Anybody know where Lincoln County is? I was raised in a little place called Denver, between Charlotte and Hickory. Now, I want to ask you a question. When I went to school, we counted 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Do you think 14 and 13 are close to each other? 
So do you think 14 has anything to do with 13? So what he's saying in 14, unless you're repenting, I can't direct your path. Unless the Spirit of God is cutting out of you your will, you'll not know God's will. So if you're asking God to direct your path, get rid of your plans. Sign a blank sheet of paper. Tell God to fill it in. We dealt with that last night. One last thing. Notice what I would call the rich possessions of the Holy Spirit. I don't leave you on a positive note. I don't leave you on a positive note. Look at verse 15. How many of you realize you're adopted? Now you didn't get saved by adoption. You got saved by the new birth. But one of the things God did for you of the 34 is he adopted you. Verse 15. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit, notice capital S, of adoption. Now how do you know you have it? Well, you have a relationship with the Heavenly Father. <clears throat> Let me just paraphrase this verse. You don't have to wait till you're 21 to get your inheritance. <laughs> the very moment you got saved, everything that Jesus has in His will, you in it. <laughs> and as rich as He is, you are too. Now you may think you're a pauper, but you're not. You're as rich as you can be, because you're adopted and nobody, nobody can write you out of the will. What's his is yours. Look at verse 17. You're heirs and joint heirs. Some of y'all know my wife and I have adopted a son. We had four, we had a girl, had another girl, had another girl, had a boy. I'll tell you a little story about the boy. I was in a meeting, and every time my wife got pregnant, she got sick. And I was in a meeting, and that was unplanned, that boy, and I called home and I said, Judy, how's everything? She said, I'm sick. When I see you, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> That's what she told me. I mean, I know she seems real nice, but I'm, I'm here to tell you. She, and, 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 and you know what I did? She tell you, I came home. I looked at the preacher and I said, I got to go home. And I had enough sense of going home. But when that boy was born, I've been forgiven ever since. We had three girls and we had a boy. And when I was pastoring over here at Greensboro, my 17-year-old, my oldest girl, got pregnant. She wasn't married. A lot of what I preach is not just sermon. I couldn't have made it without Christ being in my life. It shattered our life. Our daughter was determined to have an open adoption. The boy, his parents, they wouldn't take any responsibility. Very difficult time in our life. <coughs> my daughter was seven months pregnant. My wife and I were praying one day. My wife looked at me and she said, I believe God wants us to adopt that little boy. I said, if you think at 41, And you 39. 
that I'm starting over. And my youngest is now 12. You've lost your mind. And God said, you know nothing about what you preach. <coughs> we approached our daughter after we gave up our rights. You ever heard that, sir? Gave up my reputation. Gave up my resentments. I had to forgive some people. He's 32. He's a preacher. He's the only one that calls me every day. He calls her four and five times a day. <laughs> you may take me to task about this. But I wouldn't change a thing. By the way, where were you and God when God adopted you? What's your past? And He put you in the will. <laughs> And he's blessed you with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. My, what a God. When all four of my kids got married, Nathan was about 11 or 12. I got them all together and I said, I've changed my will. Y'all marry until he gets 21. He gets it all if we die. One of my girls said, I don't think that's right. I said, it's not yours. See, the truth is, I can write every one of my birth children out of my will. Now, they're back in it. <laughs> but you're in it forever. He's going to inherit the earth. You are too. He's going to reign on this earth. You are too. He is the king, but you're also a priest king too. I've read the last page. No devil on it, and you're in it. And your retirement plan is wonderful. He's not paying overtime. He paid it all. And all to him I owe. Thank God for the blood. Let's stand together. <coughs> Standing together with our heads bowed. I ask somebody to play the piano tonight with our heads bowed and our eyes closed for just a moment. Maybe you've not settled this issue about where you'll spend eternity. Maybe you don't know that you know that you know. If you'd like to know Christ tonight, why don't you slip out right now? Just step out and come. We'll greet you right here.
Then if you're a child of God, you'd like to get down on your knees and say, God, forgive me for not allowing the Spirit of God to mortify. God, teach me how to repent, to be transparent and honest with you every day about my self-life and my sins. God spoke to you. Maybe you just want to thank Him tonight that you're in the will. Why don't you come? Stand. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Anybody else need to come? Make sure that your name's written in the Lamb's book of life. That you belong to the Lord Jesus. That He's yours and you're His. Andre, you out here? I thought I saw Andre come in this morning. Andre, hey, come on up here for a second, brother. I thought I saw yes, you come sir. through the door. Amen. Praise his holy name. What Amen. a week. Praise the Lord. Guys, we've had a great week of service, and uh, I was just talking to Dale today, and and uh, he, he had received Christ, repented, put his faith and dependence on him, and kind of wanted to know what the kind of the <laughs> next step was. The Bible says, believe in thy heart. Uh, but then also profess with your mouth and be a witness and stuff. And so he just come to tell uh, the Lord how thankful he is and just wanted everyone to know uh, what the Lord had done in his life. And, uh, and uh, I just, uh, I'm just so tickled with that. And uh, praise the Lord, he's still convicting, still granting repentance. Still granting faith, giving us faith to believe, uh, and praise the Lord for that. And so uh, I just appreciate that so much. And so uh, Dale did that. Where's Andre at? Was he around here somewhere? <laughs> Andre, come on up here. I said, come on up here. Then he backed back off. <laughs> Andre got saved the other day, been coming to our meetings, and praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord for that. So, uh, just praise the Lord. Two, two new members of the family, and uh, here family of not our local church, but in the body of Christ, dwelt by the Holy Spirit and sealed forever, and destination sure. And now, uh, but He hadn't left us uh, just to fend for ourselves. That'd be totally inadequate for salvation. He just saved us and went off and said, "I'll see you when you get to heaven." <laughs> no, uh, uh. He did something else. He regenerated us. We've been born again, and His life has been implanted in, into us, imparted by the Holy Spirit. So praise the Lord for that. I don't have to walk this dark, gloomy place alone. He walks in me and through me, and always cutting away me so that He can live. And so I'm going to ask these fellas to just head out with uh, the First Lady, little Jamie, and Miss Judy. That's my co-First Ladies now. I think Judy's going to move up here. And so... <laughs> And I got Miss Cheryl back there. I got all kinds of first ladies in here now, <laughs> pastor's wives. So if y'all just go out with him, and we're going to give you the right hand of fellowship. And Ron's around here somewhere. He's headed out there. Oh, there he is. He's out there. Sean was eclipsing him back there. And I didn't see him anyway. Thank you again, Ron. We appreciate what a great week we've had. Thank you all for being here. Packed house Wednesday night uh, for, to hear the word of God. That's really special. And we're just so appreciative of that. And uh, we just thank you so much. I'm going to ask uh, Donald Nicholson if he closed in a word of prayer.